snowy alpine village tucked between the boulder and pioneer mountains of Idaho. What could be more romantic during the holiday season? I'm Jack Hemingway, and welcome to Incredible Idaho. The Sun Valley Lodge was built in 1936 when Avril Harriman designed America's first destination ski resort. These halls echoed with the voices of famous skiers, movie stars, philanthropists, authors. My father, Ernest Hemingway, actually wrote parts of For Whom the Bell Tolls here at the Lodge in 1939. Now we're going to make it Incredible Idaho's winter home. Our show opens tonight, most appropriately during this holiday season, with an exchange of gifts. North Dakota wild turkeys will be arriving in Idaho late this winter. In exchange, Idaho's gift, bighorn sheep from the Owyhee Desert Country. There are words we associate with the desert, barren, forsaken, desolate, forbidding. There's an eeriness to this place that haunts our imagination. Maybe it's the incredible silence, the utter stillness except for the wind. Maybe it's the ghosts, the shredded skeletons of abandoned towns clinging forlornly to the slopes of the Owyhee Mountains. Maybe it's just the peace. It seems a graveyard, a place of death. But the muted colors of the desert camouflage a world teeming with life. Rabbit, coyote, antelope, deer, and bighorn sheep. Well, it's tremendous country. I hope that Idaho citizens realize what they've got out here. This is a real unique area. Uh, those steep canyons, uh, totally unlike anything we've got in North Dakota, uh, appear to be excellent sheep habitat, and I think that's borne out by the, by the reproductive success of the sheep herd out here. The Owyhee bighorn herd is the only available source in the country for a wild sheep transplant operation like this. But it wasn't always the healthy herd it is today. The influx of miners, domestic livestock, and disease late in the 19th century decimated the original bighorn population. The last known bighorn in Owyhee County was killed east of Battle Creek in 1927. But today, this same area is the focal point of the transplant operation. In 1963, the department uh, brought a dozen sheep down here and released them in uh, the east fork of the Owyhee River drainage. And then in 1965, they brought a few more in. And over the next five, six years, between here and Little Jack's Creek, uh, there was about 37 sheep transplanted in this drainage. There were none here at that time. Today, 28 years later, biologists estimate that the bighorn population has exploded from the original 37 transplants to 1,200 wild sheep roaming the Owyhee Desert. I'd say 30, 30 animals in a group. Two Jet Ranger helicopters are used for the capture operation. The front helicopter is the gunning ship. This one carries the pilot, a spotter, the gunner, and the net gun, a device specifically designed for wild animal captures. The capture gun shoots a 12-foot square net with weights attached to each corner. The gunner chooses a sheep in the running herd and then aims for the animal's shoulders. Good job, good job. The uh, pilot's the one that really does most of the work to get him in a position that, uh, that we can get a good shot at him. Basically, you're just going to see the sheep jump into the net and then ball up on the ground. It's a lot less stressful on the animal than if they're um, not tangled very well and are able to struggle quite a bit. The second helicopter carries three muggers. Once the animal is tangled in the net, it hovers low enough for the mugging team to jump out with tools of their trade, blindfolds and hobbles. They tend to overheat. Um, when they struggle a lot, uh, we always carry water bottles with our mugging equipment so that we can keep the animals cool, basically to get them hobbled and in those bags and uh, back to the base camp just as quickly as we can. Okay, go up. Get a load, looks good. Okay, Dave, we're going to take those in. I'll get the next two. The North Dakota crew waits at base camp, ready to administer blood tests and attach radio collars and ear tags. Ten base uh, helicopter one is inbound with uh, two sheep. Now ten four, what's your ETA? Looks like about uh, ten minutes. 
An opportunity like this is a dream come true for us, where Idaho allows us to come down and get some sheep. In North Dakota, there's, there's a very romantic sentiment about the fact that we had the, the Audubon bighorns at the turn of the century. And now we've got bighorns back, and there's a lot of people in the state, and they may never see a sheep in the Badlands, but the fact that they're out there and that they know they're out there is enough for them. The Owyhee Desert, barren, forsaken, desolate, forbidding. Maybe we need new words. Spectacular, awe-inspiring, vast and magical. Maybe we need to preserve rather than abandon. If we lose this habitat, the sheep go with it, and a lot of other things that are out there. There's one now. Get a little closer. In the bighorn capture that you just watched, the sheep didn't have much choice in having their picture taken. But photographing natural animal behavior isn't nearly so easy. In this show, we had hoped to show you the rams displaying to each other, competing for the right to breed with the ewes of the herd. But this is all we were able to get. The wildlife world doesn't always cooperate with the wildlife photographer, whose job may be a great deal more difficult than one might expect. It isn't often we get to see what really happens behind the scenes. This brings another topic to mind, the ethics of wildlife photography. How can it best be done without harming the animal we're admiring? Incredible Idaho has some pretty spectacular wildlife photography but we also have a responsibility to obtain it in an ethical manner. Wildlife photographers are always trying to get the glamorous close-up shot because the, the viewers seem to appreciate that. But uh, we need to be careful of that because we become so enamored with these wildlife that it's actually possible to love them to death. Bill Crum is the director and photographer for Incredible Idaho. You have any kind of a signal at all? His talent is behind all the beautiful scenery and wonderful wildlife we see on the show. I think he's in that pile of rocks up on top where we saw those two earlier. But it isn't always as easy as it appears. When people see a program on TV, it's all packaged in nice, neat, orderly form. Uh, and uh, it's difficult to understand exactly how long it takes to get a lot of those wildlife shots. Today's a, today's a great example. We've been out uh, all day trying to get one picture of a bighorn ram, and we've got an expert biologist guiding us and uh, radio tracking equipment, and we haven't had any luck. Those kind of days go with the territory when you're photographing wildlife. But what about the good days? The times when wildlife seems so accessible? How do you know when to back off? The, the number one rule is, is the well-being of the animal. It's better to take a picture of an animal behaving naturally than to get too close and stress that animal and take a picture of it running away from you. That the, the most rewarding pictures I've taken are of animals acting naturally, uh, an, an eagle landing in a nest, a deer feeding rather than perking its head up with its ears straight up, scared. One of my favorite shots is of an osprey returning to the nest with a, a fish. Um, uh, it was a difficult shot and the light was very pretty and, and it's the animals acting the way it's supposed to act. It's returning to the nest, not flying away from it. It's more important to give the animals their space uh, than it is to try to get the glamorous close-up. Bill admits that it's been a learning process. Working with wildlife biologists has taught him to recognize the signs of animal stress and the value of a powerful lens designed to photograph wildlife from a distance. For example, from way back here, a good lens can take video like this. Everyone wins. Incredible Idaho gets a shot of an animal behaving naturally, and the deer continue to feed without interruption. But there are other ways to get that shot and still maintain an ethical distance. Bill Mullins is a biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service but he also moonlights as a wildlife photographer. His photos have appeared in national magazines such as Audubon and National Wildlife. I've had this blind set up since last night to try to get the animals kind of used to its presence. The two best tools that I've got are using a long telephoto lens and a blind so I can keep my distance. I get better pictures and I don't disturb the animals. I can be pretty far away and still get good 
pictures of even smaller animals like ducks. Yeah, there's one now. Even a little closer. A look at Bill's work reveals the time and patience invested in each shot. And like every photographer, he has his favorites. This is a, an American avocet, and it's, uh, you're sitting on a nest. And this was, a, I guess, a good example of using a blind to approach a subject and, and not disturb it. The bird almost seems to be sleeping. Stick the blind here a few Bill cautions away, that most waterfowl the hide their nests in dense there. cover. Kind of Clearing up, vegetation for a clean down shot down may down seem like a good idea, but you've there. probably prompted that animal to abandon its nest. And then they'll walk back here, you know, 20 feet away and, and hope to get a picture of that duck nest. Well, that duck nest is gone. That duck's gone. She's not going to nest there anymore. Well, I think anybody who's really interested in wildlife photography should, should also make the effort not just to learn how to use the camera and your equipment, but to learn about the animals that are trying to photograph. The welfare of the animal, that's, that's the key thing. With the best intentions, as incredible Idaho photographer Bill Crum said earlier, photographers can literally love wildlife to death. In a national park like Yellowstone, it's easy to forget that these animals are wild. In the summer, Yellowstone National Park averages over 29,000 tourists a day. The rule is that visitors must stay more than 25 yards away from any animal. But it's a difficult rule to enforce. Any time that an animal changes its behavior is a pretty good indication that, that they are affecting that animal and causing that animal some stress. You get the stresses of people interrupting the feeding behavior of an animal continually and then added to that a stress of a very severe winter and added to that possibly the stress of a drought. You, you add these stresses up and then that can be very, very harmful to the animal. Uh, I guess this photograph kind of depicts a, an example or a situation where an animal shouldn't be pushed. This is a mule deer buck that was photographed in Yellowstone Park and you know the snow's up to his belly there. Bill used his vehicle as a sort of blind once he had his shot, he immediately moved on. A certain amount of those animals aren't going to make it anyway. There's always heavy winter mortality, and uh, a couple of photographers chasing an animal around for a few days may be enough to push him over the edge. But in a place like Yellowstone, it's not only the wildlife that can be endangered by the careless photographer. Yellowstone hands each visitor literature containing warnings like this as they enter the park. To our surprise, as we were shooting this story, the first buffalo we came upon was surrounded by tourists well within the 25-yard buffer zone. God, I hope, I hope I don't see something I don't want to see. Last summer, four people were gored by bison in Yellowstone Park. The bison are not truly aggressive animals. However, they have an area in which is theirs and where they are grazing. And if they are approached too closely, then their message is get out of here and the person is charged and gored. Did it surprise you that we're, you were able to get that close? Yes, and I thought maybe he was going to get up and charge. Did you have any concerns about that? Huh? Yes. Yes, I did. I wouldn't have gone down there if the rest of the people hadn't been there. I shouldn't have gone. I think many people are unaware, perhaps, that these truly are wild animals. They're not cows in a cow pasture. They are wild animals, free-ranging, wild bison, a truly wild animal. And yet we see them on the TV screens in our living rooms day in and day out. And I think we become unaware that since they can come into our living rooms on the picture screen, that they really are a wild animal that belongs in the wild. I'd rather enjoy it from a safe distance. A telephoto lens is a lot cheaper than a new life. Whether you're an amateur or a professional, the same ethics apply. Bill Mullins counts courtesy to other photographers as important, along with the practice of captioning your photographs properly. This, this bear here, it's a nice portrait. And I was photographed, as it says here, down here at the Boise City Zoo. Uh, this is a wild grizzly in Denali National Park. You also have a responsibility, much as a hunter or fisherman, to respect private property rights. And if you're out taking pictures on somebody's farm or, or whatever, you, know, you need to ask permission. So the ethics, there's lots of things to consider. You know, it's very rewarding for a wildlife photographer to get a, a glamorous shot of an animal, a rare shot. And so we're always trying to outdo each other, trying to uh, get a better shot than the other guy. But we need to be careful about that because if we get too competitive, 
uh, the, the animal suffers because people get too close, they stay near the animal too long, and, uh, you know, we have a responsibility to the animal and we have a responsibility to the viewer to let them know that it doesn't always occur like that in nature, like what you see on TV. Norman McLean's A River Runs Through It is a favorite book of mine. He seems to capture certain aspects of fly fishing, such as the humor, the frustration, the peace, and the occasionally obsessive nature of the sport. He writes about his father, a Presbyterian minister, and also a dedicated fly fisherman. My father, he writes, was very sure about certain matters pertaining to the universe. To him, all good things, trout as well as eternal salvation, come by grace, and grace comes by art, and art does not come easy. Well, neither do big steelhead trout in Idaho. There's a certain mystique about steelhead fishing that probably isn't there for fishing for brown or rainbow trout, for instance. I think there's a little more of an art to it. There's certainly a lot of rarer fish, so it's, um, the opportunity to catch one and the chance of catching one is a lot smaller and that certainly increases the attraction uh, to catch a, a fish of that kind of size. Native steelhead returned to Idaho in the fall after one to three years spent in the ocean feeding. The big trout winter in places like the Snake River near Lewiston, living off fat reserves until spring when they move up the tributaries to their spawning grounds. But in the meantime, they encounter the gauntlet of anglers coming to Idaho from all over the country with steelhead fever. This is the, one of the premier places in North America for a steelhead, one of North America's premier large trout. I'm going to see if I can find some. Colorado angler George Jensen's chances of finding one are much improved over last year. At last count, the number of steelhead crossing Lower Granite Dam was 85,000, twice the number of last year's run but even the best trout fisherman may need to modify his technique to land a steelhead. Trout fishermen, you know, fish with logic, or at least they think they fish with logic, and they're thinking about what the fish is feeding on, everything like that, and when you're dealing with steelhead, you're dealing with uh, a fish that hasn't really fed actively since it left the ocean. Another passage in the book, A River Runs Through It, reads, if you have never picked up a fly rod before, you will soon find it factually and theologically true that man by nature is a damn mess. <laughs> fly fishing isn't new to this group of anglers, but fishing for steelhead is riddled with its own mysteries. The presentation of this is just critical. Make this fly fishing for steelhead work. A good fishing guide can give you an edge. John Patterson and his partner, John Crawford, have 14 years of steelhead experience between them, fishing with everything from spoons to spinners. But one of the most challenging ways to catch a steelhead is with a fly. You know, you have to pay attention all the time. Every cast has to be accurate, has to be controlled, you know, and you need to do the, the very best you can with it to try to stay right on top of it. Fish! <laughs> He's a hot little bugger. You know that it isn't something else. <laughs> it, it's solid. It's really, you know, and you feel, you feel, real wait for a second there's sort of a little hesitation and uh depending on the fish the hot fish will really take off then i couldn't believe it i just i only put out about a 30 foot cast and it took it right in the swing <laughs> well this fish might go 26 inches not quite a 40 incher <laughs> well, he's definitely a hatchery fish and got the dorsal down on him got the ad fin clipped off of him for sure a missing adipose fin means that it's not a wild fish, but was raised in one of Idaho's four steelhead hatcheries. As a smolt, its adipose was clipped before it was sent on its long journey to the ocean. If this were a wild steelhead, it would be catch and release only. Well, it's about a 25, 26 inch fish, little female. And she's been through some tough times one way or the other, but she made it this far. <laughs> Oh, that was fun. The very first line of the story, A River Runs Through It, reads, In our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. Perhaps that explains better than anything 
what fishing does for the soul. And what do you want him to put on your tombstone? <laughs> that he stayed home and worked or that he went steelhead fishing? <laughs> well, how about that he caught a steelhead? I don't think that's even as important as the fishing itself. I think when you get hung up on the catching a, a fish, you lose a great deal of why you're there. I love fishing in the fall. And to me, this is not the best time of year. I mean, look at the scenery that we have around us. The weather is perfect. Not that many people out. It's, it's just a neat time of year. This is absolutely fabulous. There's nothing like it. Colorado's got, got its own qualities, but Idaho has its own unique flavor, scenery, people, and fish. As we close our show tonight, we have the rare opportunity of being able to view the beautiful Owyhee Desert Canyon lands from the viewpoint of an eagle.